Book Twelfth, Chapter One of the Ambassadors by Henry James. Strether couldn't have said he had, during the previous hours, definitely expected it. Yet when later on that morning, though no later indeed than for his coming forth at ten o'clock, he saw the concierge produce on his approach a petit bleu delivered since his letters had been sent up, he recognized the appearance as the first symptom of a sequel. He then knew he had been thinking of some early sign from Chad as more likely, after all, than not, and this would be precisely the early sign. He took it so for granted that he opened the petit bleu just where he had stopped, in the pleasant cool draught of the porte cochere, only curious to see where the young man would, at such a juncture, break out. His curiosity, however, was more than gratified. The small missive, whose gummed edge he had detached without attention to the address, not being from the young man at all, but from the person whom the case gave him on the spot as still more worth while. Worth while or not, he went round to the nearest telegraph office, the big one on the boulevard, with a directness that almost confessed to a fear of the danger of delay. He might have been thinking that if he didn't go before he could think, he wouldn't perhaps go at all. He, at any rate, kept in the lower side pocket of his morning coat a very deliberate hand on his blue missive, crumpling it up rather tenderly than harshly. He wrote a reply on the boulevard also in the form of a petit bleu, which was quickly done, under pressure of the place, inasmuch as, like Madame de Vionnet's own communication, it consisted of the fewest words. She had asked him if he could do her the very great kindness of coming to see her that evening, at half-past nine, and he answered, as if nothing were easier, that he would present himself at the hour she named. She had added a line of postscript, to the effect that she would come to him elsewhere, and at his own hour if he preferred, but he took no notice of this, feeling that if he saw her at all, half the value of it would be in seeing her where he had already seen her best. He mightn't see her at all. That was one of the reflections he made, after writing, and before he dropped his closed card into the box. He mightn't see any one at all, any more at all. He might make an end as well now as ever, leaving things as they were, since he was doubtless not to leave them better, and taking his way home, so far as should appear that a home remained to him. This alternative was, for a few minutes, so sharp, that if he at last did deposit his missive, it was perhaps because the pressure of the place had an effect. There was none other, however, than the common and constant pressure, familiar to our friend under the rubric of post et telegraphe, the something in the air of these establishments, the vibration of the vast, strange life of the town, the influence of the types, the performers concocting their messages, the little prompt Paris women, arranging, pretexting, goodness knew what, driving the dreadful needle-pointed public pen at the dreadful sand-strewn public table, implements that symbolized for Strether's too interpretive innocence something more acute in manners, more sinister in morals, more fierce in the national life. After he had put in his paper he had ranged himself, he was really amused to think, on the side of the fierce, the sinister, the acute. He was carrying on a correspondence across the great city, quite in the key of the Poste de Telegraphe in general, and it was fairly as if the acceptance of that fact had come from something in his state that sorted with the occupation of his neighbours. He was mixed up with the typical tale of Paris, and so were they, poor things. How could they altogether help being? They were no worse than he, in short, and he no worse than they, if, queerly enough, no better and at all events he had settled his hash, so that he went out to begin, from that moment, his day of waiting. The great settlement was, as he felt, in his preference for seeing his correspondent in her own best conditions. That was part of the typical tale, the part most significant in respect to himself. He liked the place she lived in, the picture that each time squared itself, large and high and clear, around her, Every occasion of seeing it was a pleasure of a different shade. Yet what precisely was he doing with shades of pleasure now, and why hadn't he properly and logically compelled her to commit herself to whatever of disadvantage and penalty the situation might throw up? 
He might have proposed, as for Sarah Pocock, the cold hospitality of his own salon de lecture, in which the chill of Sarah's visit seemed still to abide, and shades of pleasure were dim. He might have suggested a stone bench in the dusty Tuileries, or a penny chair at the back part of the Champs-Élysées. These things would have been a trifle stern, and sternness alone now wouldn't be sinister. An instinct in him cast about for some form of discipline in which they might meet, some awkwardness they would suffer from, some danger, or at least some grave inconvenience they would occur. This would give a sense, which the spirit required, rather ached and sighed in the absence of, that somebody was paying something somewhere and somehow, that they were at least not all floating together on the silver stream of impunity. Just instead of that to go and see her late in the evening, as if for all the world, well, as if he were as much in the swim as anybody else, this had as little as possible in common with the penal form. Even when he had felt that objection melt away, however, the practical difference was small. The long stretch of his interval took the colour it would, and if he lived on thus with the sinister from hour to hour, it proved an easier thing than one might have supposed in advance. He reverted in thought to his old tradition, the one he had been brought up on, and which even so many years of life had but little worn away, the notion that the state of the wrongdoer, or at least this person's happiness, presented some special difficulty. What struck him now, rather, was the ease of it, for nothing in truth appeared easier. It was an ease he himself fairly tasted of for the rest of the day, giving himself quite up, not so much as trying to dress it out in any particular whatever as a difficulty, not, after all, going to see Maria, which would have been in a manner a result of such dressing, only idling, lounging, smoking, sitting in the shade, drinking lemonade, and consuming ices. The day had turned to heat and eventual thunder and he now and again went back to his hotel to find that Chad hadn't been there. He hadn't yet struck himself, since leaving Woollett so much as a loafer, though there had been times when he believed himself touching bottom. This was a deeper depth than any, and with no foresight, scarcely with a care, as to what he should bring up. He almost wondered if he didn't look demoralized and disreputable. He had the fanciful vision, as he sat and smoked, of some accidental, some motived return of the Pococks, who would be passing along the boulevard and would catch this view of him. They would have distinctly, on his appearance, every ground for scandal. But fate failed to administer even that sternness. The Pococks never passed, and Chad made no sign. Strether, meanwhile, continued to hold off from Miss Gostrey, keeping her till to-morrow, so that by evening his irresponsibility, his impunity, his luxury, had become, there was no other word for them, immense. Between nine and ten, at last, in the high clear picture, he was moving in these days, as in a gallery, from clever canvas to clever canvas, he drew a long breath. It was so presented to him from the first that the spell of his luxury wouldn't be broken. He wouldn't have, that is, to become responsible. This was admirably in the air. She had sent for him precisely to let him feel it, so that he might go on with the comfort, comfort already established, hadn't it been, of regarding his ordeal, the ordeal of the weeks of Sarah's stay, and of their climax, as safely traversed and left behind him. Didn't she just wish to assure him that she now took it all, and so kept it, that he was absolutely not to worry any more, was only to rest on his laurels, and continue generously to help her? The light in her beautiful formal room was dim, though it would do, as everything would always do. The hot night had kept out lamps, but there was a pair of clusters of candles that glimmered over the chimney-piece like the tall tapers of an altar. The windows were all open, their redundant hangings swaying a little, and he heard once more from the empty court the small plash of the fountain. From beyond this, and as from a great distance, beyond the court, beyond the corps de logis forming the front, came, as if excited and exciting, the vague voice of Paris. Strether had all along been subject to sudden gusts of fancy in connection with such matters as these 
odd starts of the historic sense, suppositions and divinations with no warrant but their intensity. Thus and so, on the eve of the great recorded dates, the days and nights of revolution, the sounds had come in, the omens, the beginnings broken out. They were the smell of revolution, the smell of the public temper, or perhaps simply the smell of blood. It was at present queer beyond words, subtle, he would have risked saying, that such suggestions should keep crossing the scene, but it was doubtless the effect of the thunder in the air, which had hung about all day without release. His hostess was dressed as for thunderous times, and it fell in with the kind of imagination we have just attributed to him, that she should be in the simplest, coolest white, of a character so old-fashioned, if he were not mistaken, that Madame Roland must on the scaffold have worn something like it. The effect was enhanced by a small black fichu, or scarf, of crepe or gauze, disposed quaintly around her bosom, and now completing as by a mystic touch the pathetic, the noble analogy. Poor Strether, in fact, scarce knew what analogy was evoked for him, as the charming woman, receiving him and making him, as she could do such things, at once familiarly and gravely welcome, moved over her great room with her image almost repeated in its polished floor, which had been fully bared for summer. The associations of the place all felt again, the gleam here and there, in the subdued light of glass and gilt and parquet, with the quietness of her own note as the centre. These things were at first as delicate as if they had been ghostly, and he was sure in a moment that whatever he should find he had come for, it wouldn't be for an impression that had previously failed him. That conviction held him from the outset, and seeming singularly to simplify, certified to him that the objects about would help him, would really help them both. No, he might never see them again. This was only too probably the last time, and he should certainly see nothing in the least degree like them. He should soon be going to where such things were not, and it would be a small mercy for memory, for fancy, to have in that stress a loaf on the shelf. He knew in advance he should look back on the perception actually sharpest with him, as on the view of something old, 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 the oldest thing he had ever personally touched. And he also knew, even while he took his companion in, as the feature among features, that memory and fancy couldn't help being enlisted for her. She might intend what she would, but this was beyond anything she could intend, with things from far back, tyrannies of history, facts of type, values, as the painters said, of expression, all working for her, and giving her the supreme chance, the chance of the happy, the really luxurious few, the chance on a great occasion to be natural and simple. She had never with him been more so, or if it was the perfection of art it would never, and that came to the same thing, be proved against her. What was truly wonderful was her way of differing so from time to time without detriment to her simplicity. Caprices, he was sure she felt, were before anything else bad manners, and that judgment in her was by itself a thing making more for safety of intercourse than anything that in his various own past intercourses he had had to reckon on. If, therefore, her presence was now quite other than the one she had shown him the night before, there was nothing of violence in the change. It was all harmony and reason. It gave him a mild, deep person, whereas he had had on the occasion to which their interview was a direct reference, a person committed to movement and surface and abounding in them. But she was in either character more remarkable for nothing than for her bridging of intervals, and this now fell in with what he understood he was to leave to her. The only thing was that, if he was to leave it all to her, why exactly had she sent for him? He had had, vaguely in advance, his explanation, his view of the probability of her wishing to set something right, to deal in some way with the fraud so lately practised on his presumed credulity. Would she attempt to carry it further, or would she blot it out? Would she throw over it some more or less happy colour, or would she do nothing about it at all? 
He perceived, soon enough at least, that however reasonable she might be, she wasn't vulgarly confused, and it herewith pressed upon him that their eminent lie, Chad's and hers, was simply after all such an inevitable tribute to good taste as he couldn't have wished them not to render. Away from them, during his vigil, he had seemed to wince at the amount of comedy involved, whereas in his present posture he could only ask himself how he should enjoy any attempt from her to take the comedy back. He shouldn't enjoy it at all, but once more and yet once more he could trust her. That is, he could trust her to make the deception right. As she presented things, the ugliness, goodness knew why, went out of them, none the less, too, that she could present them with an art of her own by not so much as touching them. She let the matter, at all events, lie where it was, where the previous twenty-four hours had placed it, appearing merely to circle about it respectfully, tenderly, almost piously, while she took up another question. She knew she hadn't really thrown dust in his eyes. This, the previous night, before they had separated, had practically passed between them, and as she had sent for him to see what the difference thus made for him might amount to, so he was conscious at the end of five minutes that he had been tried and tested. She had settled with Chad after he left them that she would, for her satisfaction, assure herself of this quantity, and Chad had, as usual, let her have her way. Chad was always letting people have their way when he felt that it would somehow turn his wheel for him. It somehow always did turn his wheel. Strether felt, oddly enough, before these facts, freshly and consentingly passive. They again so rubbed it into him that the couple thus fixing his attention were intimate, that his intervention had absolutely aided and intensified their intimacy, and that in fine he must accept the consequence of that. He had absolutely become himself, with his perceptions and his mistakes, his concessions and his reserves, the droll mixture, as it must seem to them, of his braveries and his fears, the general spectacle of his art and his innocence, almost an added link, and certainly a common priceless ground for them to meet upon. It was as if he had been hearing their very tone when she brought out a reference that was comparatively straight. "'The last twice that you've been here, you know, I never asked you,' she said with an abrupt transition. They had been pretending before this to talk simply of the charm of yesterday, and of the interest of the country they had seen. The effort was confessedly vain. Not for such talk had she invited him, and her impatient reminder was of their having done for it all the needful on his coming to her after Sarah's flight.' What she hadn't asked him then was to state to her where and how he stood for her. She had been resting on Chad's report of their midnight hour together in the boulevard Malherbe. The thing, therefore, she at present desired was ushered in by this recall of the two occasions on which, disinterested and merciful, she hadn't worried him. Tonight, truly, she would worry him, and this was her appeal to him to let her risk it. He wasn't to mind if she bored him a little. She had behaved, after all, hadn't she, so awfully, awfully well. End of Book Twelfth, Chapter One